Welcome to Happy Hour Live, episode 11. I'm Eddie Manessis. Today is Friday, May 29th. I'm going to keep this intro as short as possible because my guest today is watching after his five-year-old twins, and he might have to hop off at any moment, so I'm going to just kind of get the ball rolling so we can get as much time with him as possible. So just really quickly, thank you everybody so much for joining. Sorry we're a little bit late. We had a couple technical difficulties, but we are here and we're live and ready to do the show. So please, speaking of the show, like, comment, share. It has been amazing, all of you who have shared the, these interviews in the past. I've really appreciated it. It's really helped to kind of spread the reach, spread the word, get more viewers to this, uh, this live stream, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to grow this thing organically and get more eyeballs on the interviews. And it's really motivating me and help inspiring me to continue with this series uh, to know that people find value in it. So please take a couple seconds and share this video live to your profile. You can do it now or you can do it later. Prefer now, I promise I'll be controversy free. So like, comment, share at any time. If you have a question or a comment, put it in the chat. Uh, I can't guarantee I'll get to every question this time because Ted may have to leave early, but if we do do a full interview, full discussion, I will get to all of your questions. Uh, but so any, anytime, comment, question, anything, please put it in the chat. Okay. At the end of the interview, after I wrap with Ted, I'm going to play a video that my mother-in-law produced. Her name is Susan Morgan. She is a grief counselor at a hospital in Toronto, Canada. She made a 10 minute video that is meant to provide comfort and hold space for people who are grieving right now over the loss of a loved one during this pandemic uh, for any reason, uh, whether they died of COVID-19 or not. The sad truth is that these people are dying in hospitals alone without their families and their families don't get to be with them in their last moments. And it is a, a tragic time, an unprecedented time. So if anyone is out there who needs support, Please stick around to the end of the interview and I will play that video after we wrap. Okay. So my guest today, he needs no introduction for all you percussionists out there. You all know who he is. Everyone has seen his videos online, giving clinics, talking about the chicken wing, talking about technique, talking about uh, the mental aspect, uh, uh, talking about his career, every, everything, every aspect uh, of his approach to playing. We all know those things, uh, but to you, people who aren't percussionists or play another instrument or don't know who Ted Atkatz is. He is the former principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony. He was in that orchestra for 10 seasons and they made the decision to leave the orchestra, move to LA and start a rock band, be the front man for a rock band, which I believe he's still doing to this day. Uh, and on top of that, he is the professor of percussion at the, uh, the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at Cal State University, Long Beach. He teaches at the Lane Conservatory, and he is the percussion professor at the Colburn School downtown. He has also created this summer percussion seminar called TAPS, Ted Atkat's Percussion Seminar, that is growing wildly in popularity, and he moved it all online this year. He did a whole online interview series that was really amazing to watch, and he had, lately, in the past few years, or past decade or so, has built up his reputation as one of the most in-demand studio players in the Hollywood scoring stages. I think most recently he played, he did a couple sessions on the latest Star Wars movie. I'll verify with that him, but I think I saw a picture on Facebook where he did a session for Star Wars. So, I mean, he's done it all. It's almost like a Hollywood script. So he's also had a massive impact on my career, even though I never studied with him. He is a true force of nature. And it is my absolute pleasure to bring to you the great and wonderful Ted Atkatz. Ted, thank you Man. so much for being here. Thank you for that introduction. That was, uh, that was really thoughtful. That's kind of a, when you have to say Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at Cal State <laughs> Long Beach, like I stumble over that one. So yeah, that was hard. That's, 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 that's pretty hard. impressive. I also want <laughs> to comment, you. man, wherever you get your haircut. Oh. Is, I mean, I want to go there, man. Okay, it's well, happening. I'll put it out to all you guys in L.A. Uh, hit up Christian Tate at Tate & Co. Salon. He's in uh, West Hollywood. He actually came to my house a few weeks ago and gave me a haircut in my garage. Oh, um, he okay. wore a mask and gloves. I wore a mask. It, it, was, uh, it was great. I paid him through He'll Venmo. Come to your home. Okay. He will, during That's this awesome. time, he will do house calls if you would like. If you have like an open space to do a haircut, he will, he will do that for you. But when it's up and running, Christian Tate, I've been going to him for a decade. No, he's okay. He's great. I, yeah, I need his help right now more than ever. <laughs> You're but, looking uh, good, man. Yeah. You're rocking it. You have the thanks COVID for hair. saying that, man. You know, flattery will get you everywhere. You know this. 
Yeah. How you doing, Eddie? Thank you for having me on. Of course. I'm I'm doing well. It's been, uh, you know, just another week at home, sheltering in place. Uh, A lot going on in the world, obviously, but, uh, you know, I'm so far thankful that I'm safe. How about you? Right, right. Yeah, same here. Same here. Got to be grateful for, for what we've got. Mm-hmm. I think what you're doing is similar to you know what I was doing with with Taps Online, and it's just it's so great to connect with people, and and remember your friends, and remember you know just be in touch because it can get a little lonely. And yeah. I think I think we're all suffering through a little bit of that and the stress of you know what happens next. Yeah. So this is a this is a great a great thing you're offering. I'm glad you're doing it. Oh, thanks, man. I got got to re- return the compliment. The series you put on with the interviews with some of the greatest, like the heaviest hitters in the percussion world. I mean, it was so informative and you just kind of got a slice in their life and and they were giving away some of their biggest secrets and playing and mentality (laughs) for $2 an interview that we all paid. I mean, it was was a really great service to the percussion community. So thank you for that. Yeah, so. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. I think think people end up saying things in this format that they wouldn't ordinarily say. Yeah. Cause I think you, you get this false sense of like, oh, I'm just in my house. You know, I guess I'm just kind of talking to Eddie. Yeah. That's uh, right. And then the next thing you know. Yeah. All hell breaks uh, loose. No, the but it was, it was great. Yeah. No, yeah. it was it was so much fun to interview some of these guys who, you know, some of some of them I know really knew really well and others that I didn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, everybody had some gems where you just go, OK, yeah, that's something I just learned something today. And, and to yeah. see people like you there and professionals in there, I was like, OK. We're getting something cool accomplished yeah, here. For real. Everyone wants to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah, it was big. I, you know, I had my notepad out. Um, That's great. Yeah. So, let's. Uh, I just, I want to go back to. Was it 2006 when you left Chicago? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's go back to 2006. You were just. You've been in the orchestra for 10 seasons. One of the the greatest orchestras in the world. One of the highest positions you could achieve as a percussionist in the orchestral world you make the decision to leave and, and, you know, whether people didn't support you or did support you, I think anyone on both sides can agree that that was a really, really gutsy move. So I I kind of, you know, what was your mentality behind that and, and how did it pay off for you in the end? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. And, uh, yeah, the the further away I get from it, it's, it's easier to answer. Mm -hmm. Um, but I basically, Saw the saw looked ahead and, and looked at the future and thought um, there are other things I want to do. Um, the one you know pressing matter for for me was like I was discovering being a songwriter and uh, my band was performing mm-hmm. and we would go from you know my, the the bass player and I started the band. Rob Cassinger is still in the Chicago Symphony and oh. um, yeah. So Nico is New York, Colorado. I'm from New York. He's from Colorado. Okay. It's it's that simple. But yeah, we would play in you know at uh, Orchestra Hall. And finish a concert, which was cool, you know. Mm-hmm. And some nights were some nights were really cool, and others were, you know, as a percussionist, if you're playing, you know, triangle on a, um, I'm trying to think of, a you list know, piano uh, concerto. A list, well, list. That's that's actually a decent that, one, but that's you know, true. Like yeah, you're up in front symbol, of the stage for that one. Yeah, like suspended symbol on uh, Dvorak New World. Is that just that mm-hmm. one crash? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's pressure, you know. And if you do it well, you go like, all right, yeah, that felt good. Um, and if you do it poorly, you go, wow, I was a hundred percent wrong tonight. That was like, <laughs> that was really weak. Um, and then, I, then we'd go to, to, um, a small club and, and play in front of like 40 to 50 people. Mm-hmm. And I was more exhilarated by that, mm. you know, playing my own music. And, and, and then I was thinking, okay, I'm in my, I'm in my, you know, early thirties. I have to do this now, you mm-hmm. know? And actually, mm-hmm. our producer Jim Tulio, when we were making the record, because I took a, I took six months off from the orchestra, um, about a year and a half before leaving, and um, spent the time making the first record. And for those of you that are like under thirty, like there used to be things called records. I know you've <laughs> heard of them. And then there were like CDs. And so yeah. like somehow like I still live in that world of like you know there's like a full length release. And back in two thousand you know four two thousand five. You know, that was the medium and we were we were trying to make a CD. But the producer, Jim, he said to me, he's, you know, he's like, Teddy, if you're going to do this, you got to go all in, man. You got to You got to You know, he's from Jersey. Mm. You got to go all in. And and um, I was like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Like I the only way I got into the Chicago Symphony, you know, you know, this Eddie taking orchestral auditions, mm-hmm. it requires everything you've got. Yeah. You know, you've got to pour everything into it. 
And so then I'm thinking, all right, if I'm really going to be a songwriter and promote the band and, you know, I, I had to do it full time. There was a sequence of events that took place in which a couple people took sabbaticals. Patsy Dash took one. Um, Don Koss took one. Uh, and so I was, I had been principal percussionist and then I was also the assistant timpanist. I'd been the assistant timpanist, uh, when I, prior to winning principal percussion. So then mm -hmm. Don takes a sabbatical, right? Mm -hmm. And then management says, okay, we want you to play principal timpani. And I go, oh, that's, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. What, what, um, what should we do about the principal percussion chair for the year? And they said, oh no, we want you to do that too. Oh no. Yeah. I'm going. <laughs> uh okay that's yeah. a lot that's, that's insane. a lot yeah yeah so so i basically said okay you know here's here's what i would like to receive for that because it should at the very least be double scale yeah because it's two positions two, two you know yeah and so the, the general manager at that time who is now um she's the general manager in Nash, uh, kennedy center okay um yeah, look, look that up if you want more information on her. Okay. But she basically said, I don't understand um, what you're taught, why this is a big deal, because when you're playing timpani, you're not playing percussion. So what's the problem? Mm. So I said, OK, well, here are the things about principal percussion that are that are unique. Um, you've got to assign parts. You know, Mahler did not, you know, in the way that he wrote for clarinet, he didn't write percussion one, two, three and four. Right. It's all right? over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And Mahler is the least of our worries. Like, what about when you get like a couple of Bernstein things that are a little off the map mm -hmm. or you've never assigned a side story or, yeah. you know. And, and this and, is prior to Rainer's book that had all the assignments in it, right? Yeah, I wasn't using Rainer's book. So, you know, and I, I, I did peek in, in books like that. Actually, I felt that a lot of times the information, but the main thing I'll say about it, if the information was wrong, it was it it was only because it didn't necessarily apply to your orchestra, mm. meaning you've got to think about the strengths and weaknesses of the members of your section. Mm -hmm. And you, you need to make the assignments yourself. Not only that, you have to do it yourself because if you just go on what someone else says and you haven't done the work to figure out how it all like pieces together, mm -hmm. you're basically going to get caught out there if you don't, you know, if, if the maestro is saying, where's the triangle, right? you know, and, and you just, you know, went out of the book and you're going, well, I just went through the book and, you know, that right. should be right. But, you know, you need to know these things. Yeah. So it's a ton I'm of work outside of playing for principal. Perc I see that with Matt Howard. It's like half his job is administrative. Yeah. And so to do that yeah. and play and play timpani. I mean, that's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm explaining to Deborah Rutter that you've got to you've got to assign the parts. You've got to take care of the instruments. That's instrument rentals. That's maintenance of instruments. You've got to replace heads. And then you've got to communicate with the stage hands. Where is this stuff going? Who's mm -hmm. playing what? Give stage plots. You got to work on hiring your subs. I mean, this is all stuff you know all about it. Yeah. Um, not, and that's not even talking about the playing part. So yeah. even if you are playing timpani, you've got to be responsible to make sure that your section is making their entrances. You know, hopefully playing with some uniformity of sound, color, dynamic. Um, so you're still responsible for that section. So yeah. I went through this entire description. And at the end of it, the reply from her was, yeah, but when you're playing timpani, you're not playing percussion. Mm. Just didn't get and it. So, yeah, so then I just go, wow, okay. Um, so then I say, um, I say, okay, well, you know what? I'm not comfortable with doing this. And so I just like to do what's in my contract, which is I'd like to play principal percussion and assistant timpani. And my recommendation, if you're, if you're asking and you're not, but – what I'd recommend is find a, find a timpanist for the year, you know, bring in somebody. There's plenty of people that are qualified that would love to do it. Mm -hmm. it and instead what they did was they called me up and they said, uh, we've spoken with our attorney. Our attorney has looked at your personal contract. Your personal contract says you're supposed to play timpani, um, at the music di uh, director's discretion. And mm -hmm. Daniel Barron has asked that you play timpani. So, so they basically like, you know, went hardball. With yeah. Me. They went to semantics and yeah. So, technicalities. Okay. So, okay. So, so then, you know, everyone's got lawyers involved and, and we had to work that out. Hmm. Um, but you know, that started that kind of thing, you know, and, and basically orchestras, orchestra musicians can attest to this when things go south with your management, um, when there's disagreements between 
orchestra members and management or entire orchestras and management, like when you have things like lockout, strike. Yeah. That that bad blood doesn't go away that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those well, wars take a little time. Yeah, and, and they can be really slimy. Uh, yeah. It's not good. And, and I, yeah, and I, I found it to be, I mean, I think a lot of you listening might agree that you've experienced in your orchestra's moments where you're trying to explain to someone in management why percussion is different. Mm-hmm. You know, and it just is. It I is. mean, we're, we're not only are we different as 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 humanoids, but <laughs> our, our entire craft is like a different animal. Yeah, we're playing different instruments all the time. The choreography is intense. I mean, ask ask violinists; they'll say like, "Wow, I don't know how you do that. Like, how yeah. do you play between these seven instruments?" So yeah, it's very it, different it's a experience. Different animal. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I don't think I'm alone in in saying that. You know, there's going to be times when the management doesn't understand what it is we do Mm -hmm. anyway um that was definitely a component of this and so when i saw when things ended up going poorly in my next negotiation and i'd been thinking about maybe it's time to to pursue you know nico and pursue pursue being a songwriter i was like okay this is this is the message is clear Mm -hmm. so so that duality of some of the pressure from from management and then my feelings about maybe kind of setting myself free aligned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost like a sign that, you know, like they didn't yeah. make it difficult for you for to make a decision. It seems. Yeah. I mean, it, it really was that way. And, and of course I don't want to, I, I certainly don't want to blame it on anyone else because everyone makes their own decisions, but it, it certainly set me on this path in which I was like, yeah, let's, uh, let's try this. And actually the, the several months after I left the orchestra were easily the most exhilarating times of my life as a musician. Wow. In, in what uh, way? Well, I, I specifically remember reading an article that was in the New York Times that was written about me. I was reading it on my smartphone, which was a new thing. Yeah. Um, so it was very exciting to like be reading the New York Times and reading about um, this guy that quit the orchestra. And I was in the back of the Nyko van, which was a big red Euro van, which you yeah, probably remember. I remember that, yep. And so one of the bandmates was driving and I was just go, going, okay, we're living now. Mm-hmm. We're, we, you know, we were driving to like some, you know, small town in Michigan to do like club, a, a weekend of club dates. Mm. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was on the edge and, you know, we didn't come back with much money. Um, it was sort of like making one fan at a time mm-hmm. kind of thing. And it was really exhilarating. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't regret it for a moment. That's awesome. Did you did you catch a lot of grief for leaving from your colleagues or family members? You know, not a lot. Um, my my dad was like, "No, Ted, don't don't quit the symphony, please. Don't make right. that mistake." Secure was job, terrible. yeah. Yeah, and it's like that's what parents do. You know, they mm-hmm. worry. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. So some of his pragmatism probably is why I pursued like going for an orchestra job in the first place. Because let's face it, um, you know. There, there are other less surefire ways to go in music. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it's easy to get a symphony job, but you can see a path towards, okay, I can make a living doing this. Um, I enjoy doing it, but it'll afford me the, the ability to do other kinds of music. Yeah. So there, there's a pragmatism that enters people's minds, I think, um, that beyond just like, well, I just love playing Brahms and I love playing Stravinsky. And, and that's, you know, other people go in the other direction. They go, I love playing you know, a Kehoe and Steve Reich, and mm. that's where I'm going. Right. Um, and I think that's great too. Um, but anyway, yeah, my, my dad was not into it. One guy in the orchestra who's still in the orchestra now, who's in his eighties. Oh, wow. Said to me, uh, well, you must be making a lot of money with your band. <laughs> and I said, well, no, I'm not. no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, really? Oh. And I go, yeah, you must you must think I'm crazy or stupid, right? Or or, or both. Yeah. yeah, that's about right. <laughs> so I mean, he you know he he was he was definitely going. What are you thinking? Yeah. And another guy, another guy who was a little older than me said, um, you know, if if I was doing what you're doing and had the you know what you have going, I would do it too. And it's it's a little too late for me. Mm. So you had so, both sides, both both perspectives. Yeah. And actually, this, that second one stuck with me more. Yeah, you know, because, because it's like you, you have to do it. You have a window. Yeah, you, and you, you don't want to live with regret either. You know. 
Yeah. And, and that's kind of how I got into, into being a professional in the first place was, you know, I wasn't intending to become a orchestral musician during my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I was teaching general music in Worcester, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. You know, and like, you know, every 45 minutes was a different classroom and it was rough. Wow. Man. I didn't know rough. that. I didn't know that about you. You know, those scenes, you ever watched The Wire? Oh, yeah. Well, it's been one of the best shows in the history of the universe, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And, then, and then season four is is like all about the schools. Yeah. yeah. And they have this one classroom where they, they basically have a security guard and they're just trying to teach people just to like get through the day. Mm -hmm. That's what this school was like. Wow. It was rough, man. It was rough. And, and I'd walk out of there, you know, at three o'clock and drive 60 miles home going, oh, geez. yeah, I can't. I can't do this. Yeah. I can't. I can't you doing this i just was i didn't have the fortitude you know? no that hard. that would be really really difficult that'd be challenging yeah, I, life I, I really, yeah hats off to to like public school teachers that mm -hmm. that do it, do it well because it is a challenge man yeah so so yeah so um at that point i'm like okay i gotta go do a master's and i gotta go pursue being an orchestral musician and if i fail i can i won't live with regret right so I w it was that same mentality that I've, you know, that I applied when I left the orchestra. Right. Well, wow, that's funny. That's uh, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. And yeah. Use it. That's yeah. that's great. So really quickly, I just want to give a couple of shout outs. Brandon Chance, he wrote first. He has been the first viewer on or the first commenter on a lot of my interviews. Brandon, good friend of mine, former interviewee on the show. Diana Morgan, my wife as well. She posted a, a link to your band's website. Uh, Peter Schlor. Good to see you again. He says, hi, Eddie and Ted. And Diana said, y'all are different. Yep, we are. We're definitely different <laughs> for sure. She's right. So, so Nyko then, you started Nyko before you, you know, a few years before leaving the orchestra. Uh, you were going to give it your all. What were your initial aspirations for the band and, you know, the impetus behind moving out to L.A., trying to make yeah. it happen, what you wanted yeah. to happen and, and what has happened in the past yeah, How, yeah. Ten years, decades since you. Yeah, it's, since you that's a good, good question. Yeah, um, yeah. I started the band in Chicago, and uh, at some point, I said to my buddy Rob, I said, you know, he was bass player in CSO, and I said, Rob, man, why don't we just quit the orchestra and like go on the road and do this? I mean, it's it's good. It's and I'm feeling it. And, you know, we can we could do this. And he goes, I got two kids and a mortgage. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was like, damn, you know, that's that's rough. And of course, um, you know, as you get older and you have kids, you know, yeah, you, and a mortgage. You, have, you have to change yeah. and a mortgage. Yeah. Right. You have to kind of change your um, change your outlook a little bit. Um, so I continued in Chicago for a little while with with some great musicians. Um, the drummer, Devin Staples, is still playing in Chicago. He's awesome. Mm. And uh, it was it was a blast. And um, but um Jill, my wife, she had just quit her job um, after me, mm -hmm. uh, which I wrote a song about. And um, <laughs> yeah, and and uh, we we were starting to look at like, OK, what else is out there? Mm -hmm. You know, and and so I'd always wanted to move to L.A. Mm -hmm. ever since I visited my buddy, Mike Valerio. Oh, um, right, who's, yeah. you, you know, my yeah, famous he's, bass player in the, yeah, in the he's, Hollywood he's scene. Kind of, yeah, best. And mm -hmm. uh he, I would visit him, and he. That was the first time I came to L.A. and, and check it out. And the weather, the vibe, everything just appealed to me. And so I'd been thinking about L.A. for you know six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And then um, when Jill got a job at UCLA, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, we're going. Yeah. So we drove out, and um, and then I reformed the band about um, probably about a year in. So I took okay. a little time off, tried to you know get settled in L.A. a little bit, and um, then reformed the band. Okay. And, and so, and so that, you were the only original member at this yeah, point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And the guys that I found out here, awesome, awesome players. And um, we did we did a little touring. We played South by Southwest. We played locally. We cut a record and some singles. And um, yeah, I mean, it. You know, we still, you know, make a little money on residuals from the, you know, the YouTube and the sales oh, nice. and, and that. But. You know, in I think anyone that does indie music can can attest to, you got to get a lot of Spotify listens mm -hmm. before you start making enough to like pay a mortgage. Right, you got to be Drake <laughs> so, status, a, you, bill yeah. a billion listens. How much is it per play? Like point zero zero something of a oh, cent. Man. It's it's really depressing. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like 
we're getting played. If someone had told me when I started, like your music's going to be listened to in 21 countries and you're going to have roughly, you know, 300 listens per day. Um, I would say, wow, man, we'll be touring and we will have yeah. made it we'll have a fan base. And, um, you know, I get a hundred dollar check every yeah. couple months. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. So it's rough. It, and I think that, um, that's one of the areas that, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, the music industry has changed drastically with digital mm-hmm. media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, a kid, while we were touring, some high schooler came up, he's like, I love your music, man. Where can I get it? And I was like, this is like, you know, 2006. I'm like, yeah, you can buy our CD on the website. And he goes, oh, I don't pay for music, bro. Oh, and no. I, I was, at the time, I, I was like, what's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. And now, of course, you know, most of us, if we're paying for music at all, it's like a subscription it's service a subscription, that we're paying yeah. $10 a month. Mm-hmm. And then we're listening to unlimited, you know, unlimited music. Yeah, ad free. Yeah. So yeah, so who gets burnt? You know, it's the, right. it's the artist. So That's yeah, true. like f- finding a way to monet- monetize um, my original music uh, didn't really materialize. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, it's it's the thing. One of the other things I'm I'm really proud of is like having three records and yeah. a bunch of EPs and and um yeah, we're, Mike and I are working on a new project. It may be under a new band name. And mm-hmm. uh, we've got we've been slowed a little bit by coronavirus, but we're sending right. things back and forth. And yeah, I'm still still writing. That's great, man. It could be like uh, the first Postal Service album where they were sending files back and forth from yeah, Seattle yeah. to L.A. or whatever. That's uh, a, that's a good record. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. wow. So that's good that you're still going. Yeah. Did, so, so would you say that the state of the record industry is like what? What is what is your like? The state of the record industry is kind of responsible for what has happened with the band, or happened for your rock career, or the like... record industry is responsible <laughs> for all of my ailments. No, it's um, it's um, no. I I mean, look, you know, it's you either you either make it or you don't, you know. Mm. And and I think that you know, talk about needle in a haystack stats. You right. Know? It's like right, right, right. Everything everything that we do in life you know, we're taking, we're taking odds, you know, whether we realize it or not, you know, crossing the street against traffic, Mm -hmm. you know, running a red light, um, or something even safer, you know, but it's, but it's like with, with everything we do, you know, we're taking a risk and it's like, yeah, you, you know, if you try to be a famous rock band, you know, you're most likely going to fall on your face, Mm -hmm. but people, people keep doing it. Yeah. You know, if you want to be a, yeah, they love it. You know, if you want to be a professional golfer, you're probably never going to make a dime and you're probably going to spend your, all your parents' money. Mm-hmm. But people are still doing it and parents are still, you know, sending sending little Billy out there to be a professional golfer. Right. And uh, and how about orchestral percussionists? Yeah. You know, That's what I was sending- thinking. I, I was thinking that yeah. with you, it's like, well, you, you already did something that is, I think, on paper impossible. And <laughs> uh, and so now it's like, here I go. I'm going to you know do it again. Well, man, I got to say, you know, at the risk of, of comparing myself to, to much bigger people, you know, it's like when Michael Jordan decides that he's going to go into baseball, right. the whole world goes like, dude, what are you thinking? Like, don't do that. Yeah. And sure enough, he was a total flop. Right. But Michael, having not ever failed at life, or at least hitting, hitting a big plateau, goes, yeah, I can do whatever I want. You right. know? And, why, and why shouldn't I? Who's going to yeah. stop me? And yeah. it's, it's either, again, it's that, you know, courage or stupidity that, that leads you down these, these crazy roads. And right. uh, yeah, I mean, basically it's kind of like you live by the sword and die by the sword. And, um, so far, you know, to continue doing that mm-hmm. has been very fulfilling and exciting. Yeah. It's exhilarating, isn't it? It's like, totally. You just, it also kind of lets you put, uh, you kind of just trust that you're going to be taken care of if you keep pursuing things with intention. I mean, that's certainly how I feel in my life. It's like, okay, as long as I'm intentional and I'm and I'm pursuing something, I seem to be constantly caught by some sort of net that keeps me afloat and and it keeps my career going and helped me build my own career here in L.A. So absolutely, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I think I think you know that's what I say to my students is like, if you're dedicated to this and if you're passionate about it and you're willing to take a lot of um, criticism and rejection, mm-hmm. you will absolutely make it. Yeah. In some way, in some way, in some way. And and it'll look different than what you imagine it being. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. that's, that's sure. I mean, because every every step for me has been pretty much unimaginable. You know, mm-hmm. I couldn't have I couldn't have projected it, you know, 10 right. years early or even five. Maybe it's something in the water in Chicago, you and MJ deciding to do just like go out way out there. He's a role model for sure, man. <laughs> Why not? That's awesome. So yeah. you come out to L.A. That's when we first meet, I think, in 2009. Uh, I met you up in Santa Barbara when you were subbing with Santa Barbara. And I was just starting my career. I was like only had Santa Barbara and I was walking dogs on the side. Yeah. Um, so from there, I mean, you're just tra- you're trying to your band. You're trying to get something, you know, so, so your, your band isn't making as much money as you wanted it to. How did you go from there? Were, were you kind of holding your career in question? And how did you go from that to having uh, a professor a professorship or, or just head of percussion at three different universities at the same yeah. time and becoming well, we'll talk about the studios later because that's its own thing but i yeah. mean how did you build a career from that once you got out here yeah good question i um i would say that you know one thing that i realized <clears throat> excuse me is there's nothing that can help you to to catapult yourself into other aspects of of a musical career than winning like a principal job in an orchestra hmm. and and so um you know, it, it feels like another lifetime ago, but when I look at the things that have developed for me professionally, so much of that is is related to, um, you know, that that initial status, which I think is um, is is great for those that get it, and it's also dangerous because some people abuse it, and some people sit back on their laurels after after winning. Mm-hmm. Um, other people are are that good or better, and they just never got the they never got the title. Right. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it's a very dangerous thing. I, I, I found it interesting that um, before I joined the CSO, you know, my opinion was, you know, anyone that knew me would might ask me something. But all of a sudden, once I get the job, people that didn't know, know me are going, hey, you know, can I get a lesson? Can I get your input? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was no different. You know, I was the same person. Um, but yeah, and then conversely, once you leave the orchestra, the opposite happens. Oh, so, so yeah, I've, I found that in in some cases it was kind of like okay, well this guy's you know not relevant anymore, um, in in the field in that field. However, um, I'd been teaching at University of Miami, and then I got a job at Lynn Conservatory, mm-hmm. and I'd been commuting from Chicago. I oh, still wow. remember those those like six a.m. flights in like, yeah. like February and how cold it was, <sighs> leaving the, leaving the apartment at four in the morning. Yeah, I, I don't miss that man. No, I but, bet not. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I was teaching there. <clears throat> and so when we moved out to L.A., the idea was that I would continue to commute and that would be a job I continued to do flying back mm. and forth. OK. Um, and then I was I was doing some freelancing, as you know, and and kind of piecing it together. Um, I was also teaching at the Music Academy during the summers. Right. Um, and and clearly those positions are were attainable because of of my title in the in the orchestra. Mm. Um, so then um you know, the, the studio thing happens. It doesn't happen. You know, you, you know, this, uh, from your experiences, you know, you, you yeah. in, you're waiting for the phone to ring or the, or the right. Deadline, yeah. So, we'll, we'll, so if we want to get in the studios, let's talk about that. So for those of you who don't live in LA, it is a very closed circuit. The studio scene is incredibly closed and you kind of, in my estimation, I don't know, maybe Ted can uh, enlighten me a little bit, but in my estimation, it's it's like you you kind of just build your reputation up around L.A. And one day you might get a chance to be playing in the studios. Like, And, and a lot of these young guys in the studios are, you know, in their 40s, like mid 40s, and they're just now breaking into the studio scene. Um, and it seems to take a long time to get in. Yet, you you know you got in relatively quickly and, and it became successful relatively quickly. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I I would say that um, yeah, it, I, I think one of the things you you have to do is you know now it, I'd say more in in the studio scene in L.A. than anything else, you're really as only as good as as you were today. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that that's an industry in in which there's not tenure and mm-hmm. you're recommended based on the strength of your playing, uh, and if you do get a shot at it. It's got to be quite good. Um, it is. It's really uh, close knit and competitive only because there's just not that many um, job calls. You know, there, I think there was a time in the 80s and 90s when guys and girls were doing triples every day. Yeah. The cards companies were moving instruments all over town, 
And, uh, you know, guys were doing a 10 to one, a two to five, a seven to 10, six, six days a week. Right. And you were calling um, the service, like, where am I working today? Like, where, where which studio I am I at today? Yeah. Yeah. And I think those were sort of like the, the halcyon years for the studios, you know, the, the high times. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, for a while I was working on and off and going, boy, you know, it'd really be nice to, you know, like get a, a bunch of calls. Um, and then I started realizing like, well, the, the amount of work is, it's not like there's 10 guys that are working every day in as percussionists. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot slower than, than maybe it was, but yeah, there, that has happened and I feel really fortunate to do it. The musicians, uh, that I, that I work with there are such high level musicians. Yeah. I mean, in, yeah. in ways that, you know, I was, I've called it like sneaky good yeah. because they don't, you know, we've heard of Chris Lamb and we've heard of Will Hudgens and we've mm -hmm. heard, we've heard of Cynthia Ye. Um, and we haven't necessarily, you know, Wade Calbreath is not a household name. Brian Kilgore. He should be. Yeah. He should be. You know, all of those guys. Brian. Greg Goodall, Don yeah. Williams. Like they all have these incredible strengths as musicians and, yeah. and you have to be really, really sensitive to what's happening. And every session is a different vibe with the composer, the conductor, the engineer, how mm -hmm. they're miking up the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the drums. Like mm -hmm. sometimes they have you just like pounding and other times like everything's got to be really light. And it's so much based on how things are being mic'd and yeah. how much gain there is on it. So yeah, it really yeah. is up to them. It's funny, just the t the few times that I've been there, how like they'll ask for the bass drum to be played like super lightly or whatever, like along the edge. And you're like, man, that is the thinnest sounding bass drum ever. And then in all of some magic they work in the in the booth. It's like it's like a the footprint of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, like <laughs> in the, it's, it's crazy what they're yeah. able to do in there, but it, it is really magic. And yeah, those players, uh, like Wade, you know, I've, obviously I've worked with Ken, I've worked with all those guys. And just when you play with them live, I think when you're at, for me, when I'm at home, I'm thinking, you know, I listen to a soundtrack. I'm like, well, whatever, you know, they can do take after take after take and do whatever, uh, you know, they're good musicians, but they can do take after take. And then when I play with them live, they are, incredible i don't understand it's almost it's i don't understand i don't understand how they're able to read so well uh yeah. like they're almost like all you know like concert pianists who can just like show up and read whatever yeah. anything on any instrument especially someone yeah. like you know i'm specifically thinking of wade who can just play anything anytime at any time of the day whatever you put in front of him he'll lay it down the first time and that is a rare thing to see oh he's he's heavy man he's heavy mm -hmm. and and definitely an inspiration and and you know that it's when you're playing with good players you're inspired to be better and yeah. these guys have been have been like sort of inspiring and competing in in that way in, mm -hmm. in a positive way um but yeah when they work together they, they work great together and yeah fitting into that has been like a really fun challenge and and yeah. not to say that uh uh, I know that'll continue because, you know, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's basically you're you're only as good as your 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 last performance, hmm. and I think that's a good thing. You know, it's a good right. thing, and it keeps, and it you keeps everybody. Toes. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes, and and it makes it very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Have you have you witnessed that, or have you had an experience in the studios where like the, I'm not going to get called again, and then you inevitably do, but have you had a near death moment? Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I think everybody everybody has. I mean, sometimes sometimes you get a you get a part that's um, either just really tricky and mm -hmm. and not and doesn't feel sight readable, or it's maybe written not so uh, idiomatically well mm -hmm. for the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I've learned is like if you can't if you think you can't play it in the first shot, then you you've got to you've got to sort of create something that you can. Oh, and, okay. and the good players are doing that. So they're rewriting all the time. Really? And, and no one bats an eye because wow, they do it, it fits. They do it, they fits and they do it really smartly. And, um, that's what they do. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, these guys, Wade and Greg and Ken, uh, you know, they don't really shy away from like reading a, a two octave scalar thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're not afraid of it. Uh, yeah. and so there, there's a lot to learn about that. And that's, that's why I tell my students like sight reading is a lost art. You, if you yeah. can't do it as well as these guys, you know, you, you got to practice. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, they get a lot of practice through their work on top of practicing it at home. Yeah. It's just be kind of in their blood. Uh, yeah. 
And I, you know, and that equips them for when they come to play with the orchestra, they also already sound amazing from the get go. Yeah. Wade said to me on, on one of the things, he goes, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to give out the parts beforehand. It's just, it's just more fun to just read it. <laughs> Sure, Wade. And you know what? That that's true for him. Yeah. Yeah, it's true for him. Yeah, it's like a nice yep. little challenge. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I remember that one recording we did with uh, for when Tom Hooten played the trumpet concerto with John Williams that we were on, and it had a pretty nasty vibe part, like really fast. You know, it was it was like a flowy piano part, like but on a vibraphone. You know, it's like you're covering five feet of space, and. Uh, and, I, and you had that part, and I remember looking over every time it would come, and you're just laying it down. Do you remember that? Were you secondary composing there, or did, did, was that something that you just kind of recognized the scale and just the arpeggio, and you're like, okay, it's this uh, pattern? I I, yeah, I, th I think that was marimba, wasn't it? It was like in the Oh, it was marimba. Of, yeah, it was marimba. That's yeah, right. it was yeah. in the lower end of the marimba. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, no, I, I looked at it. <laughs> I looked at it beforehand. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I wasn't just reading that one. Um, but no, I was I was playing that because John Williams is really specific about his percussion writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's really wild is that you know when you when you record with him or you play, perform with him live, you've got all these really um, iconic licks. You know, like like if you're playing Star Wars and you have a digga 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 and and you know you practice that and you're probably going like yeah got this and then yeah. if you play that for him and you're playing it too loud, he's going. Glockenspiel, that's way too loud, baby, right. please. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, uh, yeah, he wants all this stuff really precise, but he wants it really delicate. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was glad I knew that because I didn't want to stick out too far of the texture because I, I have been playing with the BSO. Uh, I remember playing with him and he, I was playing Glockenspiel and you know, I got the hand from him a couple of mm. times. And I'm like, mm -hmm. dude, you wrote this great part. Like, I know. Don't you want to hear it? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I've been getting back into the Star Wars soundtracks because my kids are obsessed with it. Right. And, uh, man, the music's so good. I know. It's so good. Can you can you go into that experience? So you you played on one. How many sessions did you play for the, the latest Star Wars movie? Um, I think it was I think it was two or three. And um, I've done I've done some other stuff with him. He did a movie called BFG, which I think was kind of a, the movie was kind of a flop. Mm. But it was, it was Big Friendly Giant. Oh, and right. Yeah, I worked yeah. with him on that, and okay. um, yeah, no, it was, it was it was amazing. I mean, the energy in the room when when the orchestra is playing like the original title, mm -hmm. you know, and he doesn't um, use click. He doesn't like to use click. He he doesn't like to use click. Yeah, he doesn't like to use click. All and organic. So yeah, it's organic. Yeah, and so there's there's a real like mind meld happening with the orchestra and John, and there's a definite you know you feel this energy in the room, you know. Um, it, with BFG, you know, Steven Spielberg shows up and you're going, okay, this mm -hmm. feels, you know, there's some heat yeah. in this room, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and you're like, wow, and it's, this... it's, yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. I mean, I've, I've basically tried for years to be like, oh, come on, John Williams, he just steals everything. You know, he's just, <laughs> he's just borrowing from Mahler and Stravinsky and that, you know, and then I listen to it. It's like, no man, that's Darth Vader's theme. And, yeah. and we still can sing Darth Vader's theme, you know, 40 plus years later. It's just, yeah. It's awesome. It is so, iconic yeah, music. It's iconic, yeah. And and there is a real rush that comes with when you're when you're recording with a with a well known composer and or director, mm -hmm. like a, doing doing Spike Lee's latest movie. And you know, I grew up in New York and was a huge Spike Lee fan and saw him courtside on TV at right. every Nick game. And I was right, like, right, man, right. I wish I was friends with Spike Lee. And you know, and and sure enough, you know, I got to meet him. And he's explaining to the orchestra like what's happening in the scene, and he has us watch the scene, hmm. and, and and that's like, and there was a lot, it was a lot of war music because it was based in Vietnam. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, it that was like so compelling mm -hmm. and and so energizing to like see Spike in the room and be right. playing for him. You know? That's amazing. Yeah. Like your childhood, one of your childhood heroes, you. You just like, you know, you don't plan on meeting them and all of a sudden you don't know the context, oh, you don't know when, and all of a sudden there you are in the same room. It's yeah, such a surreal no. experience. LA is crazy, man. I, it is I, met, crazy. I, met, I met Pete Townsend the, the same week and oh, uh, yeah. I was just like, yeah, I've got like pictures on my phone of me and Spike and then Pete Townsend. It's like, I, what do you say to Pete Townsend? Like, dude, yeah, you know, I, I've been listening to your music since I was nine. Like, yeah. Let me sing you everything I know. You know it's like, <laughs> what do you tell him? Like, yeah, my band covered Eminence Front. Like, 
you just don't like my head was exploding, but yeah. you know, I tried to keep my mouth shut. You know, <laughs> I think that's the best thing. I, I, when, whenever I see a celebrity or a musician around town, uh, my method is to quietly acknowledge them, but like not say anything because I feel like they're probably just bombarded daily. And meanwhile, so. they're the guy, you're the guy they want to talk to because you're like mild mannered and you're not going to like get in their face. And right. they, be, they probably want to come up to you. They probably come up to you, Eddie. <laughs> Maybe. Like, where do you get your hair cut, bro? Yeah. Oh, that would be great. I would, you know, I'm, I'm happy to promote Christian uh, as much as possible. If any celebrities yeah. out there want to talk to me, I'm going to need his number. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. were you on the, on the very last date for star Wars on the, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I was, oh, okay. I, I'm going to go with no, I think okay. I was on a, a maximum of, of maybe three days of the last movie. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Cause I just, I, remember seeing someone's post on Facebook of them rapping and uh, just everyone standing ovation for John Williams. And I, I just can imagine the energy in that room, you know, such yeah. an iconic moment. And in the end, you know, he said he's not going to do any more Star Wars movies, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, wow, like what a special time to be in that um, room. Yeah. Pretty, pretty unbelievable. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that he, I hope he'll do some more. You know, yeah. I feel like he's he's not done, but uh, you know, he's he's been going for a long time. I know, and he's still yeah. he's, he's got a lot of energy. I see him every summer at the bowl. I play with him every summer at the bowl. He's still going strong, man. Like he, you know, it's it's wonderful to see. I'm sad I don't get to play with him this year, but you yeah, know, hopefully next year for sure. Uh, it's yeah, really cool. So you played with him. You played with him a bunch with the Phil, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, fortunately, Joe has hired me. So in, in Joe's contract. He doesn't play pops concerts uh, at the bowl. Like it's in his contract, and as much as he would like to play for John Williams, he doesn't want to set a precedent for just like being selective with pops concerts. So yep. the past two years, I've got to play timpani for those shows, and it's all it just it, both years. It just makes my year to do that. And it's it's an unbelievable experience. Seventeen thousand yeah. people every night, just going crazy, and lightsabers Total everywhere. Gosh. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, like, it's I, like I, I can die happy. I got to play the Star Wars book. I, I was playing timpani for Joe uh, like seven or eight years ago and mm -hmm. talk about a rush. Yeah, the oh, lightsabers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, going through like Darth Vader's theme on timpani. That one's mm -hmm. not easy. No, it's tough, man. It's fast yeah. too. Yeah. It goes I mean, fast. there's a reason why that stuff is becoming, you know, excerpt material because yeah. orchestras are playing pops mm -hmm. and you got to be able to play these like happy feet sort of timpani, yeah. you know, tunes. Yep. Yep. Uh, really quickly, I just want to go back and read some comments. Uh, Matthew Mansaruk, looking good, Ted. Matt Stop Howard. <laughs> Matt Howard, dudes. What's up, Matt? I'm glad you're Dude. checking in here. Brandon Shantz, YOLO. I think he was referring to you starting the band and leaving the orchestra. Uh, Greg Cohen, guys, exclamation mark. What's up with percussions? Dudes, guys, YOLO. What's up? That's, oh. that's our thing. Uh, Brandon Arve, Ted, and with a million exclamation marks. Uh, and he also says Ted has been killing it. Congrats on all the success. This is really uh, th this is really happy hour for the rest of the gang. I, yeah. I I'm just drinking water, so I I'm behind. But you guys Same. are clearly fun. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you guys are having fun. Yeah, I haven't had yeah. a drink on the show. Every time I like personal note, every time I look back and take notes on my show when I was drinking, I would get so annoyed by myself every time I took a drink, and I was like, I can't yeah. do that anymore. It's it's over. It's over well, for me. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have minded, but I I respect your uh, your decision. Thank you. I can be neurotic. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, let's briefly let's talk about marriage, kids, and juggling all that. So now you you know you you and Jill got married. Uh, a few years later, you have twins, and you're still building this career, teaching at three different conservatories, and doing everything you do. So, how has that been for you? <laughs> Yeah, it's been exciting. It's been it's been challenging. I mean, I think anybody that has kids, um, particularly newborn kids, you know, through the age of two, it's a challenge. And uh, you know, we were we were challenged like everyone else, particularly with twins. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've been married for ten years, and our boys wow. are five. Wow. And um, yeah, I mean, the you know the the quarantine and of the pandemic is obviously difficult, but it's a it's great to be able to like connect with my family every day, mm -hmm. be home for dinner every day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, there's some great things that come out of it. And my friends that have kids, you know, have, have a similar reaction. It's like, wow, you know, we never would have gotten this time. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, I think that is the struggle for every 
uh, professional that that has a, a family to um, uh, a family to, to take care of is is how do you balance your time between being a professional and earning a living and working hard and and you know being there for your family and so yeah finding that balance I think it's an ongoing process um, but yeah I think I've I've gotten to a point where um, sort of I'm able to manage the the different responsibilities of, of the different schools and, and be there for my students and uh, do the other um, playing stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, you know, right now when you look at what's happening with orchestras and the fact that, um, you know, we, they may not work for some time. Yeah. I think everybody, you know, needs to kind of branch out a bit and figure out, you know, where they're going to make their ends meet. So in that way, you know, doing the, you know, what do we call this, this hustle of, you know, the, the gig economy, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I'm afraid to say, I think that that's, that's perhaps a bit more the wave of the future. Right. Um, so it, everyone's required to do a little bit of a side hustle and, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of part, part of what it is to be a musician, I think. Yeah. Is, uh, what is your prediction for the future? Once we get back to things, what do you think it's going to be like for freelancers in Los Angeles? Yeah. Well, I think I think everyone's saying that the the world is going to change. You know, the world's mm-hmm. never going to be the same. And I think that's that's a cliche that you have to dig into more deeply. Um, I think some things are going to change. You know, I think there's going to be plenty of office space uh, and retail space available. Mm-hmm. If you want to if you want to start a new clothing line, you could probably rent that you know place on Hollywood Boulevard for half the price in two years. That's right. that's what I think is going to happen. But do I think that music's going to go away? Do I think this is the end of uh, orchestras or Broadway or studios and movies? No, we, we want to be entertained. I, mm-hmm. There's nothing I love more than going to see a great orchestra perform. Like I, I love being entertained. I love going to sporting events. We all do, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so that's not going to change. It's the problem is that we're just so impatient. Right. We just, I mean, you know, you, we all remember this, like two weeks in, it's like, ah, mm-hmm. you know, a month in, it's like, okay, I, I think I can do this. And now we're, you know, reopening the country. And, and in my opinion, it's very premature, mm-hmm. you know, we, and so as musicians, we just have to be extremely patient and we have to figure out how to be productive and how to be emotionally upbeat. Mm. Uh, because, you know, it's, I think to to act like you know life is is somewhat normal. It's like it's we're all in 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 crisis and there's yeah. the unknown. We don't know what's next. The main thing I would say is try and stay upbeat. Fi- find you know new new interests, new passions. Pursue things that you backburned for a long time. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be a little while. Mm-hmm. Do yeah, you I think? Mean, sorry. Uh, do you think that studio work is going to move more to remote recording? And if so. Do you think that Hollywood remote recording can expand beyond Hollywood to, you know, maybe people will move out of California if they can remote record from, you know, Wyoming and send it in? Or do you think yeah. do you think that's a possibility? I think that's a possibility. Yeah, I I, I hope it doesn't not only for personal reasons, mm-hmm. um, you know, because it but also because I think that there's there's always going to be something to having the band in the room together. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think like the music of John Williams, when you listen to how tight the orchestra is, mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, sure. Yeah. Pro Tools and all that. But it's like he actually gets the orchestra to play with like, pay, you know, dynamic pacing that matches, you know, in right. which the entire woodwind section plays with the same dynamic pacing. Mm-hmm. Um, can you possibly have that happen when people are recording independently? And the answer is. May or may not be yes. Um, so to answer your question, I think it's possible. I hope it doesn't happen because there's a real magic to to what happens in in these studios and these large orchestral rooms, yeah. like Warner Brothers and Fox and Sony. Yeah, especially with a composer like John Williams, who is famous and doesn't use click. You know, so you know how yeah. do you do that remotely? It's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So uh, we have a question from Brandon Arve. Thoughts on how music in colleges will change because of the new realities for musicians, parentheses, flooded market and fewer positions available. How do colleges adapt to actually serve students instead of students serving the institution? It's a big yeah, one. Yeah, Brandon, that's a great question. And, and Brandon, I know that you've been thinking about that for a long time. And uh, I'll tell you this. Um, 
in the fall because Long Beach State is already announcing that we're going to be online. Mm. Uh, we're not going to be doing our, our chamber music live. Yeah. And so we um, one of the faculty members and I sort of Uh, collaborated on some ideas and it turns out that in the fall i'm going to be teaching like a pop songwriting class nice two two units of that and um yeah i mean there's we're also offering um classes in pro tools and logic that's great um yeah home studio kind of stuff um even a sort of more remedial like garage band thing because let's face it wouldn't it be great if we were all really amazing songwriters right now? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, I'll just I'll just get my rig going, yeah. get some beats going, and and write some stuff on the keys and lay down some tracks. I mean, yeah. that's that's something we should all know how to do. Yeah, and a lot and, of people and, make yeah. good livings out of that. You know, just selling jingles, I, selling little things, just by with their computer and a keyboard, and a, and that's it. Absolutely. So you know, shouldn't we all have that experience? in college of learning to do something creative. Mm-hmm. And the truth is at most conservatories, um, most students go through the entire four years and they never actually compose anything or, um, you know, certainly not pop pop songs, yeah. but that's something that everyone should know. And, um, yeah, we're going to endeavor to, to do it online. And, um, USC actually has been doing that for a number of years. They've oh. got a pop music. Program. Yeah. 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 They have a pop music major. Yeah. 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 Right. So we're going to, we're going to borrow a couple of their ideas and and see how it goes. But yeah, my hope is that because of this pandemic, um, that we will impart these changes uh, for good, mm-hmm. uh, so that people are learning skills that are you know more contemporary. Yeah. Uh, because yes, there it there may come a time when it's a saturated market and there's just not as many orchestra positions. There may not be as many orchestras for some time. We don't yeah. know. Yeah. No, those are all good points, and yeah, I agree. Like you need, um, you need a tech an education, education in tech for as a musician. Like it's it's becoming essential nowadays. You have to yeah. know how to use these things. I wish that I wish that I'd been learning Pro Tools, you know, yeah. ten years ago. Same. Um, Same. Yeah, it, it's very useful. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I just want to tell a brief anecdote, anecdote before we go, uh, and how. You know, I've only took a couple lessons with you. I've I've never like studied with you extensively, but you've had a massive impact on my career. You, uh, when we were when you first moved out to LA, we became friends because we were playing Santa Barbara. Both of us had a lot more free time back then. We were hanging out pretty regularly, I think, back in the day. And you had my wife and I, Diana, over to dinner, and you also had Joe Pereira there. And if not for that dinner and meeting Joe Pereira, I never would have gone to USC. I never would have gone back to USC to study with him and, and Jim for their first year teaching there. If I hadn't gone there, I never would have met Matt Howard. I never would have met Andres Pichardo. Uh, Andres never would have told me about the Cirque du Soleil audition that I won because I heard about it from him. I never would have become, you know, Matt never would have become one of my closest friends. I wouldn't be subbing with the LA Phil. If I hadn't studied with Joe, I wouldn't be playing timpani with the LA Phil. So it's crazy how someone can have that big of an impact in your life. And so I just got to thank you for inviting me to dinner that one night, even though Joe made us buy $22 <laughs> shots of tequila afterwards. I really, you know, it's, it's really been paid back tenfold for sure. Yeah, that was an investment, man, yeah. for your liver as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, it's you, you never know how how life will it will change and and how it'll turn on a dime. But yeah, it's you were you were in the right place at the right time, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and, and uh, did we have what did we have that night? Do you remember? I don't we, remember. I just remember uh, Joe recommending the tequila shots, and we're like, yeah, we'll have a tequila shot, and it was twenty two dollars <laughs> a shot, and they like cleaned out my bank account basically at that time. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, he's got expensive taste, man. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, well, it was delicious tequila. It was. Yeah. Well, Ted, thank you so much for being here, for doing this show and telling your story. You, I feel like, you know, with the right screenplay and the right director, that could be the next Whiplash or the next La La Land. It's such an interesting life you've had. And, and you're what, you're 46, 47, something like that? Yeah, whatever. Somewhere around there. I mean, you're you're a young you're a young guy, and you've lived a full life in, in that amount of time, and it's really remarkable. And you know, I'm, I'm honored to to know you and, and have you as a friend and as a colleague, and uh, hope to see you on the other side of this this shutdown. Yeah, man. Likewise, I, I love what you're doing, and and thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone for for listening, and hope it was. Uh, if not enlightening, entertaining. But yeah, thanks for having me, Eddie. And hope to see everybody soon. Yeah. All right. Uh, go uh, have a good evening with your family. Okay. Right, see man. you soon, man. Take it easy. Bye-bye.
Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. I hope you found that informative. I mean, such a good story, such a great life that he's lived, so much information and uh, so open about sharing it. So, yeah, thank you again for watching. As promised at the, at the intro, I am now going to play a video that was made by my, uh, my mother-in-law, Susan Morgan, in Toronto, Canada. This is for anyone who is grieving right now if they've lost a loved one or someone close to them during this pandemic. Hopefully it provides some amount of comfort. Uh, I know in the percussion world, we lost a giant in Alan Abel a few weeks ago. And uh, obviously there is the horrific tragedy that is the murder of George Floyd by four Minneapolis police officers. So I hope this provides some measure of comfort to anyone who needs it. I want to warmly welcome each one of you and thank you very much for joining me. My name is Susan Morgan and I'm a spiritual care provider with St. Elizabeth Healthcare, working in the community alongside our wonderful nurses, rehabilitation therapists, and personal support workers, often in the area of palliative care. Our organization wanted to offer a sacred space and opportunity for a reflective moment though it must be in a virtual way at this time. It is difficult to grieve at the best of times, and all the more so given our current physical distancing. In the wake of the death of a family member, many people are having to grieve alone without the near presence of their communities of friends and extended family, just at a time when warmth and reassurance is most needed. During this isolating and difficult time, you may have experienced loss directly with the death of a loved one, or witnessed the suffering of other families who have been separated from a sick or dying loved one. You may have been unable to be present at the bedside during the final hours. you may well have watched others experience separation and loss. I would like to draw your attention to the reflection room and encourage you to explore what it has to offer. But now I would like you to join me for our memorial moment. We have come together this evening to remember and to celebrate the lives of our loved ones who have gone before us into death and to affirm the significance and the beauty of their lives. This candle is lit in honor of those who have died to signify the depth of our loss. By its light, we remember the light of their own lives. I'd like to share with you a poem from the 12th century, long ago, but one which I believe has stood the test of time. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, to love, to hope, to dream, and oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this love, but a holy thing, to love what death can touch. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was a gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death can touch. One of the great and I think unspoken fears of those who are dying is that they will soon be forgotten. The poignant and profound question, who will remember me? How soon will I be forgotten? May be spoken 
or unspoken, but I believe it's always there. Knowing this, we can hopefully appreciate and understand how our act of remembering is truly an act of compassion in honour of our loved ones. I would invite you now to recall those in your care, those in your community of friends, or in your own families who have died, perhaps recently or some time ago. Hold that name in the silence of your heart and I'll pause as you do so. Let us pray. Creator of life, help us to sense your presence in this moment of loss. May we know that nothing, not even death, can separate us from the life that created us and from the lives of those we have loved. We give thanks for the many touches of love we have experienced over their lifetimes. We give thanks for their ongoing presence in all the days of our lives yet to come. Amen. May all that was cherished and important to your loved one be remembered and honoured by those who follow. As you recall the goodness of your loved one, may you recognize that their goodness has become part of who you are. Beloved ones, dearly departed, we know that you have gone into our Creator's deeper presence into that communion of angels and saints, all our ancestors, all our relations surrounding us now. May they hold you precious until we meet again. There are places in the heart that do not yet exist. Suffering has to enter in for them to come to be. May you be open to your grief. May you be present for your sorrow. Throughout our days ahead, we can continue to hold in our hearts, in our awareness, those others who are grieving. We are alone in our grief, and we are together in our grieving. I'd like to close as I began with two poems. The first, also from Antiquity by St. Simeon. I'll repeat it, it's short. Unable to perceive the shape of you, I find you all around me. Your presence fills my eyes with your love. It humbles my heart, for you are everywhere. Unable to perceive the shape of you, I find you all around me. Your presence fills my eyes with your love. It humbles my heart, for you are everywhere. and the second by Irish poet John O'Donoghue. May there be some beautiful surprise waiting for you inside of death, something you never knew or felt, held now and forever within the embrace for which your soul was eternally made. May your heart be speechless 
at the sight of all you had hoped for, where each and everything is at last its true self within that serene belonging that dwells beside us, just on the other side of what we can see. Let us go forth now to live and to love and to take care of each other as those we remember this evening would have us do. Thank you.